of the June meeting of AHSA. And as those who don't know me, I'm Warwick Henry, the president here, and Peter Dunn, our secretary, is handling all the technical information there and instruments. So welcome all local members and uh, people that are there in Zoom land. We're going to have now from Beryl Purdom about the Royal Air Force Victor Bomber and what it didn't or didn't do. I'm waiting to see what you have a story about there. Okay, I'll hand the mic over to you. I'll just pin it on your... There. Over to you. Thank you. Well, hello. Good day. I'm Daryl Purdom. Um, is there any accountants in our audience? Do they know accountants? No? They're all at their uh, New Year's Eve party tonight. Think about it. <laughs> yes, yes, no. Now that we've met <laughs> along. Okay. Um, uh, I chose this photo for the heading page because I have the three Victor, the three V bombers in the photograph. It's a fairly modern one. I don't know what the Nimrod is doing in there. But you, but you have uh, your Valiant on the left, Victor in the middle top, and the Vulcan on our right in there. But we're going to concentrate on uh, the Victor in the story. So um, you can read that while I'm just uh, situating the talk. What I'm going to do is uh, go straight to the, the nub of the matter and read you uh, the test pilot's report on the incident. He was uh, John Baker, and uh, it was written immediately after the incident, uh, like the debrief report. Um, then I'll go on and introduce my father to you all and uh, show you uh, my father's collection of uh, blue steel images from uh, his time in the project. Then I'll explain my dad's role on the day of the incident. Um, <clears throat> near the end, I'll talk uh, uh, again, read from a report uh, that's actually online from a fellow called John Saxon. Uh, he was sitting in the, in the uh, crew cabin at the rear of the aircraft. He was a mister, and I'll explain that as well. Then I'll uh, conclude with a couple of uh, uh, incidences or uh, associated uh, controversies uh, towards the end. In the photograph there, uh, <clears throat> in the middle, is, is the crew. Um, so these are uh, six gents. Uh, normal crew size in uh, a Victor is five, but there were six up there on this occasion. There were three uh, RAF servicemen and three civilians. So the captain uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the flight was a AV, AV row uh, test pilot. Uh, and uh, I'll read from his report now. That uh, um, newspaper clipping is from my father's collection. Um, it's not on Trove yet. So the advertiser is one of those newspapers that uh, don't necessarily fully support Trove. Okay, I'll explain a little bit about that paper uh, at the end as well. So this is uh, uh, the test pilot's report from Victor XL161. Um, for the incident on the 17th of August, 1962. It was a carryover flight number W100 of 48 to be conducted at 50,000 feet. <clears throat> carryover flight means uh, you, you flew your weapon over the range without the intention to launch. So I've misrepresented this talk. When I look back at it, the advertising we put together said that this was a launch flight. It wasn't, it was a carryover flight. Um, so takeoff time was uh, one ten in the afternoon. Um, <clears throat> takeoff weight, believe it or not, was 177,500 pounds. This is a big aeroplane. Um, weather was fine, cloud nil. Visibility was 30 miles at takeoff and 150 miles at altitude. They touched down at uh, 4.20 p.m. Uh, with considerably less weight. All flight instruments were operating normally on takeoff and during the climb at 300 knots into 0.86 Mach. Auto stabilizers were on and functioning correctly and all cockpit checks had been carried out. 
During the climb to 50,000 feet at an altitude of 47,000 feet and 0.86 max still, a gradual push force was required to maintain Mach number and ASI. When it became obvious that too much continuous push force was being demanded between 10 to 15 pounds plus trimming, John's first impressions were that a Mach trim fault had developed or an elevator trim runaway had occurred or Trimmel was not operating. Now you've got to remember in here, I'm not a pilot. That's why I'm reading this. I'm not trying to interpret it at all. Now, uh, John then glanced at the Mac trim and elevator trim indicators, and they were operating normally. By this time, his flight panel was indicating 0.76 Mac and about 215 knots. A quick cross check, however, on the second pilot's panel showed 1.03 Mac and 260 knots ASI. At precisely that moment, that he thought his instruments were unserviceable, that the aircraft was in fact accelerating, and whilst taking corrective action, so this is the captain thought he was going too fast, having pushed forward on the stick, uh, he took action and throttled back uh, the engines and extended the air brakes. At that time, a violent pitch up took place, throwing the aircraft almost inverted. Here he is at 40 something thousand feet. This maneuver seemed to take a split second and the ensuing rolling, pitching and banking could not be controlled. Eventually, about 15 to 20 seconds later, they were in a spin to starboard, but the right way up. Height was lost very rapidly and the abandoned aircraft switch was operated. The crew were unable to move, however. There were plus 3G and minus 4G was subsequently noticed on the accelerometer. Recovery from the spin could not be made using either anti or pro spin controls. And as a final resource, the bra braking parachute was used as an anti spin chute. The chute deployed and remained deployed for five to six seconds and controlled the spin. It pitched the nose down as he had hoped. The nose flaps were out on auto selection and they were selected then to be out. I have looked up what nose flaps are. I do not know. Yeah, on the wings. The crew were told to remain with the aircraft and full recovery was made at about 17 to 16,000 feet, a loss of nearly 30,000 feet from the initial altitude. It was impossible to attempt any VHS, VHF transmission during these maneuvers. However, <clears throat> now air traffic control were informed of their emergency and a chase aircraft requested as soon as possible to inspect the wings, tail plane, pitot heads, etc. Both ASI indicators now appeared serviceable and indicating 220 to 230 knots at 14,000 feet. It was decided that the store, the weapon, full of high test peroxide and kerosene <clears throat> should be jettisoned in the Port Wakefield area was felt that the store tanks may have ruptured and apart from the added weight on landing, the danger was too high to take chances. Note should be taken that the release unit and crutching system held the store in position during the uncontrolled flight, which greatly pleases my father. Later, you'll see. The store was jettisoned from 12,000 feet in the prescribed safety area. Release speed was 210 knots. It was cross-checked with green satin and forecast winds. As was expected, the unmodified doors consider, uh, caused considerable buffing uh, when the, after the store was released. Okay, I had a Meteor Chase aircraft that checked uh, for any damage. No damage was observed. Now they had to uh, circulate to consume fuel. So they, uh, John notes that they left as much fuel as possible in the wing groups to give wing relief loading. Uh, the Meteor couldn't stay with them the whole time that they were consuming fuel. It was replaced by a, the Meteor was a RAF Meteor. They were replaced by a RAAF Canberra, piloted by Wing Commander, the RAF Wing Commander, Glenn. They uh, marshaled them into a landing uh, at an, uh, from about 5,000 feet uh, on their left. Uh, overshooting at 100 to 200 feet. 
So Wing Commander Glenn called out speeds and they would cross-check their own instruments and all was well. Touchdown was made at 115 to 120 knots and little or no breaks or uh, with little or no breaks, remembering that they had no drag shoot at this stage. Uh, fire tenders were positioned and brakes and wheels were checked before taxiing to a dispersal area. He makes some conclusions and some recommendations. At this point, he's a test pilot, you've got to remember, so he's already thinking about how, to, uh, uh, how this happened and uh, what needs to be done. So he attributed at this time the incident to a direct failure in the first pilot's pitot-static system. He notes that the braking parachute undoubtedly uh, recovered the aircraft and he, he notes that the initial pitch up, the automated pitch up uh, maneuver was very severe with little or no warning when uh, uh, Mach number was exceeded at that altitude. I'll skip down to the end where he's uh, basically um, acknowledged that he's written this before the um, the weapons in instrumentation was examined. Don't forget this was a trial for launching a blue steel weapon and it had its own instrumentation. So the, everything else in the aircraft uh, worked fine. Uh, engines, hydraulics, electrics, everything uh, remained serviceable throughout the flight. At the end, he points out that this was a very similar incident to another Victor, XL668 at Boscombe Down, uh, sometime earlier, didn't mention the date. So this you know, drag chute give you an idea of how big that thing is. Now, uh, at this point, I'll introduce my father. Here he is, aged about 21, 20 to 21, um, with uh, photographs from his collection that I, had, I was not aware of until um, my mother handed these down to us uh, with television in 1951. Now, you know that uh, TV wasn't introduced until 56. That's when it went public. But from uh, the late 1940s, 1950 onwards, there was all sorts of experimentation and trials and demonstrations going on around the country before they introduced it. So that's, um, I'm assuming, my dad um, earning a little penny on the side. So uh, just background on my father. At age 17, dad had had enough of education and, his, and my grandfather, at his wits end and un, unknown to my dad, enlisted in, in the Air Force. <laughs> so. Uh, He's off uh, on a three-day train journey to uh, Melbourne from Perth uh, to, to become a radio apprentice within the RAF. He attended Melbourne Technical College for just over two years, but one day in his third year, early in his third year, uh, an overzealous doctor at, uh, at the hospital at Laverton discovered that he had rheumatic fever and they discharged him. Uh, from the Air Force is medically, permanently medically unfit. So this is an apprentice in his third year. The RAF, however, looked after him and allowed him to stay with his unit uh, until they were transferred to Ballarat. He then got a job at the college, I assume that's where the TVs came in, where he completed his Diploma of Engineering. Uh, on completion of his Diploma, he used his last few shillings to buy, buy a plane ticket back to Perth, where he stayed a year before applying for a position at the long range weapons establishment Salisbury in South Australia. He arrived at single men's hostel Penfield in January 1955. Right, so just because I had to have something on the screen, I'm using his group's certificates from that era to um, look at where he's employed and where he was at those particular times. So um, my mum and dad were married in February 1956 in Adelaide and to get somewhere to live, dad applied for a job in Woomera where he was to run the Doppler instrument instrumentation section on Range E at Woomera. Range E is the big one, the big range that extends over the, to the Western Australian coastline. This, uh, this position lasted for over two years with, and he says with many with times of great excitement and sometimes a little danger. While there, I think I've talked about this before, the Russians launched Sputnik and my mum spent many nights employed manning some instrumentation which tracked the erratic orbits. 
Now with that, when I was going through that, this is the first time I saw an address in Woomera. I was able to go on Google Earth and uh, find it. So that house uh, where we lived in Woomera still exists. That's it there on the right. That just looks like any backyard Queensland house out of the city, the country house. Uh, but across the road is uh, num at number 10 is what I remember from family photographs. A uh, little bit starker than that, uh, what number nine looks like now. So uh, also in dad's collection uh, from this time in Woomera is that photograph. Uh, that's the Black Knight uh, missile, uh, rocket. Read it there. Um, it was launched... That rocket was the first launched on the 7th of September, 1958, near the end of my dad's tour. Total of 22 launch missiles, no failures. Uh, and scale is very um, uh, deceiving here. When you look at the figures in the background against the missile, the missile looks, or the rocket looks huge, uh, but it really wasn't all that much bigger than a, the blue steel missile. Mm -hmm. All right, so, it's either a wide-angled lens or, uh, yeah. Now, uh, after the time in Woomera, they appointed him as the missile preparation officer on Blue Steel, um, the British uh, nuclear standoff bomb. This is his plane ticket from Adelaide to the UK um, uh, to undertake some training. I thought that was rather cool, a handwritten aeroplane ticket with a stamp on it. You can see up the top there, he's uh, to be treated as an equivalent flight lieutenant uh, in terms of his entitlements. I don't know what that meant, but uh, with, the, with the flight, I don't know, there were three days to get to the UK, I think something like that in those days. So they would have had accommodation and, and food and whatnot along the way. All right, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on here. Um, there, just to finish off Dad's story in aviation, Started off at AV Row, but as the uh, British companies went through a period of amalgamation and, and uh, takeovers, there's some other very famous names in there. Um, after this particular project was finished uh, in 1964, Dad was offered a job in the UK to work on a joint Anglo-French low-level missile. While we, the family, and Dad were en route to the UK, the French cancelled the agreement. So we landed in UK uh, with that, out dad having a job. He, write, he wrote in uh, his notes that he firmly believed that missile went on to become the Exocet, that the French uh, developed it on their own. So on his first day at Hawker Siddeley Dynamics in Hatfield in, in the UK, dad was offered a choice of immediately returning to Australia with the family, big disappointment, or working in any area of the missile department he chose. He immediately selected the area of data reduction and computer programming, and he was in the air-to-air -air missile program. And from that point on, he was hooked on computing. Came back to Australia with some computing qualifications that didn't exist in Australia. All right, but let's get back on the core story. Uh, and what was my, my dad doing on the day? So that's a picture of me and my father uh, in the early 60s at Edinburgh. So um, I don't know this, whether this was before or after. This was probably after his training because we've got a, a valiant at the air show there. He wasn't a particularly good photographer, but that's an a air display at Edin Edinburgh with a, a, a valiant doing some handling. On the valiant Victor, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about aeroplanes or bombs, uh, but basically the valiants were the first ones involved in the program, in the missile program, flew, flew a heck of a lot of the early missions, uh, but the Victors and Vulcans really finished it off because uh, the Valiants uh, were showing fatigue problems and uh, they actually never flew, uh, they never stood up a the nuclear deterrent in Valiants. It had basically gone by the time the, the missile was validated. So um, all three miss all three B bomber types, however, uh, carried or uh, ferried the missiles out to Australia. Uh, you'll remember Victors and Vulcans for their 
involvement in uh, the Falklands War and the uh, the long distance attacks on Stanley Airport, etc. Now, uh, this photograph was in my collection, thanks to Patrick O'Connell. He was a, I don't know if he still is, a uh, Heritage Centre member when I first joined, got all enthusiastic, gave me a packet of photographs. And, and it was this. Now that WP206 flew a heck of a lot of sorties uh, with the trials unit in Edinburgh. So it was on there. It was part of the trials unit. Uh, didn't actually fly or drop any uh, blue steel weapons, but uh, yeah, did over 50 sorties training and uh, validation, crew validation type uh, stuff. I don't know, it might have even been an airborne chase aircraft, for all I know. I just wanted to show you this little bit of a cutaway of the, the blue steel. So um, the, the, the missile had a hydrogen nuclear warhead. And it was released from both the Vulcan and Victor bombers. It flew to its target using inertial navigation. This was uh, really the, uh, the first operational use of inertial nav. The, before the project was finished, they realized that technology, that's, uh, missiles and interceptor aircraft had advanced so much that the high altitude flight of the bomber was too vulnerable. So low level launchings were tried. This is my dad's note. This tested the pilot's skill as he had to get the huge plane out of the way before the missile engines ignited and shot up in front of his nose. <laughs> so you could shoot yourself down if you weren't careful with the blue steel. But the other thing I'd like to just pay attention to at the moment on the missile, it actually had two motors, this large one and the small one there. So the large motor uh, remember, the, the missile was launched subsonic. Uh, it was a Mach 2 plus. Some uh, uh, references said it was Mach 3. So that uh, the big motor got the, uh, the missile up to uh, high Mach for those days and um, also to altitude. So it uh, got it up to around about 60 or 70,000 feet from where, whatever altitude it was launched. And the smaller rocket motor was uh, a, a cruise motor, if you like. Some of the videos I watched uh, for researching this, it was pretty obvious when the motors changed over. You could see it in their contrast. So I, I've included this uh, just really to make a uh, point about data. You've got the blue, blue steel on the left and two American missiles on the, in the middle and the Russian on the right. They were comparable missiles from the age, but Every time you put, you, you go look at somewhere different for data like this, the data is different. So on here, um, the, for example, uh, where's the range? 150 miles here. Um, depending on whether it was a high altitude or a low altitude launch of the missile, it was a different range. So uh, low altitude, it went down to about 105, 107 uh, miles range. So that's just there. If you replay the video, you can <laughs> look at some of the data. Now that these uh, photographs now are, are in my dad's collection. So they're of the trials. Um, some of them you'll see in books. If you, um, if you read Fire Across the Desert, the history of Woomera, for example, that photograph on the right with the shadow of the aircraft on the ground is, um, is in that book. And it's probably the, the one I've seen most often around uh, on the web. Now that would be a low altitude launch, all right? That missile drops a fair way before the motor ignites and then starts to push it well enough to make it climb uh, up out of the way. All right, so the Woomera trials, you've got to remember Woomera is where they bought the live weapons in, in terms of the, the motors, all right? The, the, the Brits uh, dropped plenty in Boscombe down, but they were all uh, ballistic launches. They just dropped the missile um, into the ocean mostly. But in Woomera, this is where they bought them to run the motors. So all the, the weapons that came out to Australia, I assume, and that's, I know that's not right, uh, were fired. We'll talk about that later. So 122 flights had intention to launch, but there are only 49 actual launches. Um, so the, the weapon system was being 
trialed and tested, and there's anything doubtful, they didn't launch. Anything, oh, I'm not quite sure, they didn't launch. So um, some of these um, photos, they should just roll through in about 10 seconds spacing if, uh, if this works. And that's a left and right uh, image. On that one, you can see Lake Hun, Hun that, that lake in the image there. So I was able to find that on Google, Google Earth. And the center line of the, um, uh, of the range is just to the right of that lake. A couple of nose on shots. That uh, supersonic looking shot, I'm not sure whether that was in a, a wind tunnel, whether that was a live fire. Again, the left and the right view of the same missile. This one, uh, they don't explain the color scheme except to start, say it didn't paint them a dark color very often at all. But the, this one, it shows how far away it gets before the motor ignites there and it starts uh, climbing away. These, these shots, um, if you look at it closely after the, the launch, you'll see the uh, how quickly the aircraft peels away from the the, the, the line of flight of the missile. So I haven't seen all of these uh, published before, um, but these are not my dad's photographs, obviously. They were uh, package uh, official photographs. They had um, information written on the back and I can't explain what that uh, nomenclature. You can see the Victor peeling off from his now uh, lit missile. I don't, I don't know what the uh, nomenclature on the back of the, of the photos mean. Now the flights uh, were either training, launch flights, or carryover flights. I think I've uh, explained that already. Carry, carryovers uh, were testing the whole configuration before they launched. Generally, each missile got three flights, two carryovers and a launch flight. It's a big missile, uh, weighed six tons empty, over seven and a quarter tons, I think, full of fuel and armed and 36 feet long. So 12 yards, maybe 10 meters long. But um, you've got to remember, um, Dad didn't talk a lot about this. He was subject to the British Official Secrets Act. And if you look up the act, once you're, it applies to you, it applies forever. It has no termination date. Somebody else has to declassify it and have it out there. It doesn't just automatically expire in 50 years or 30 years or whatever. But the British Official Secrets Act, uh, somebody has to declassify the information. It doesn't run out with time. Right, so Dad didn't really didn't talk about these things. Uh, but people wrote to him people who knew that his involvement and who wanted to write their own articles and put their own heads on the block, wrote to him and asked him to proofread their materials. One of the uh, documents that dad kept a copy of, uh, I found this little note. At the bottom in my dad's writing, he says, I was the OISC for this missile and signed it off for this flight. So I don't know what the S means in OISC, but officer in charge is how I read that. Yeah. Anybody got any hints? Senior charge. <laughs> yeah. Well, the way he'd explained it to me, it was his team that loaded the missile mm -hmm. on the day. So what was involved in that, uh, in loading missiles? So a uh, ferry aircraft would bring um, a, a round out from the UK. Uh, they would uh, take it off the ferry aircraft, uh, unload it, and then check it out, uh, hook it up for instrumentation, whatever they were doing and put it on the uh, drop aircraft, which the drop aircraft were different because they were instrumented uh, with cameras and recording equipment, uh, unlike the ferry aircraft. I've left this one in here though for something later on. Just have a look at this door, the uh, crew entrance door in here. You see it has uh, a blind on the forward side. The, the side of the door facing forward has a solid state, solid, blank there. Does anybody know what it's for? Why would they do that on a door? Well, it was, this was the crew escape path. All right. So the crew in the back didn't have ejection seats. The 
the air crew did. The pilot, two pilots in the front had uh, seat ejection seats, but the anybody in the back had to make their own way to the door and jump out. Now, if you jumped out of there while you were in fast forward flight, what's the first thing you're going to hit? The engines. <laughs> yeah, look at it's just a, a, a feed shoot straight into the engines. All right. So that blind there is meant to protect you from the slipstream a little bit of coming around the aeroplane, let you get below the engine, and all you'll hit there is the bottom of the wing. Yeah, they, they slid down. Yeah. And that was a nasty business when you when you watch the videos of that. So, now these, uh, the, t the photograph at the top and the bottom right are in my dad's collection. Uh, you'll also see some of these in books. Um, but that's the one where my dad said to me that this is a picture of his crew uh, handling a missile. So um, in this particular case, they've lifted uh, the missile off this high trailer here. This is a, I got this off the, off the web, the internet, but this is um, Long Range Weapons Establishment now in uh, Salisbury. They've, they're bringing it from the labs behind the trees back there in, in the direction of the loading bay. But you see it's on a high trailer, a relatively high trailer behind the tractor there. To get uh, it uh, set up to load onto an aircraft, they had to transfer it onto a low trailer. You can see that it's basically scraping the ground. You'll see some photos earlier of that. Now to, to, to load that then into a Valiant or a Victor bomber, uh, they didn't have any uh, integral uh, winches or loading system to pull that into the airplane. You had to put a derrick above the aircraft, which lowered a piston down through the aircraft, hooked onto the missile, and then this external hydraulic derrick lifted the, the ordnance into the aircraft. It's amazing to see. If, if you look on the Imperial War Museum website for a film, there's a film on there that uh, describes it. It's about four films, so it's quite a, a big exercise. Uh, the Vulcan, on the other hand, was had its own autonomous hydraulic loading system and it loaded itself. Now, uh, Dad also described to me going when he went to work, he used to muck around in puddles in gumboots. That's all he told me as a little 10-year-old. All right. But the, uh, the fuel for the uh, missile incorporated what they call a high test peroxide and kerosene. HTP is very, very volatile, nasty stuff. Uh, when it burns in kerosene, it just basically creates CO2 and steam. So the contrail is steam up there, the chemical process. And he uh, describes, like I said, walking around in gumboots, in puddles of water. Now, this is posed for the camera. Um, you know that because on the bottom right, the ground isn't even wet here, closing the panels on the missile down here, closing or opening that panel on the missile. Um, for all I know, my father is in that video, but I can't recognize him. <laughs> He's in that photograph, those photographs. All right. I know there's uh, somebody there who's he's wearing different PPP to everybody else. So he might be a different role uh, than the load crew in there. I expect he has a different role with that different suit on. But enough to say the fuel is very nasty stuff. Okay, now I'm going to read again. So um, this is uh, uh, an account from a fellow called John Saxon. Uh, his account is online. Uh, I should have the web address up there uh, somewhere, but uh, he called this the Victor incident. So it was going to be another blue steel carryover trial to test missile systems. They had almost become routine. John was a civilian working with Elliott Brothers, an English firm now part of GEC, we think. Uh, and they were concluding the first development phase of one of the world's first inertial navigation systems which was used in the blue, blue steel. They were fully fueled with kerosene and HTP uh, rather than the nasty mi mixture. So the loading bay was fairly well flooded with water just in case. And that uh, was what my father said. That earlier photograph was just for the camera. 
So uh, once uh, all six were aboard and everyone was satisfied, uh, they taxied it and took off, turning southwest to climb to their first navigational fix point around Kangaroo Island. Now, despite being an aircraft weighing nearly 80 tonnes, the Victor was no slouch in the climbing stakes. Uh, John had been from sea level to 50,000 feet in about eight minutes, eight minutes, but it was, took a little longer with the blue st steel loaded. Nevertheless, the 10,000 foot climb points were passing rapidly until we got to around 46,000 feet, and then all heck broke loose. That was his word. I would have used stronger language. Uh, lots of rapid discussion and attempts to pull up from the front deck. The start of a real roller coaster ride, pitch ups, pullovers, etc., with engine noise doing wonderful things. Then what seemed from the back to be a wing over, followed by increasingly, increasingly violent positive and negative G forces, John Baker activated the abandoned aircraft signs, which also dumped cabin pressure. And Frank, who was nominally the first out the rear door, unstrapped and hit the roof quite violently and took no further escape action. In the normal escape plan, I was next to get out and I managed to half stand and hang on to the camera bracket in front of the nav equipment, but I could get no further towards the side door as we were, ro ro were rotating fast in what seemed to be a very steep dive. Then, af then after what seemed like a long time, actually about 20 seconds, there was a loud bang from the rear of the aircraft and the rotation changed to a near vertical dive and rapid pull out, accompanied by much creaking and groaning, pencils, pads, etc., flying in all directions. But we were back in semi-level flight at around 16,000 feet. Here is what he believes in much later what actually happened. Uh, when we got to 45,000 feet or so, the right-hand airspeed indicator said, 1.03 Mac. This sent a transonic flight signal to the auto stabilizers, which initiated a pitch up maneuver as the Victors were not designed to go supersonic. The pilots, however, compared right and left hand uh, speed indicators and uh, were inclined to believe the right hand system that they were at Mac. So they too tried to reduce speed, and which contributed to the violent pitch up at almost inverted position, followed by the rapid spin and loss of control. So the, the two factors there together. The whole incident lasted about 60 seconds with a descent from 46,000 feet to 16,000 feet in about 20 seconds, vertically supersonic. I did the math. I can't believe it, but yeah, they would have had to have been supersonic to do it in that short of time. So several things happened before we finally got to land. First, there was the concern about the correct airspeed. Uh, we validated that with the chase aircraft. Then it was decided to jettison uh, the missiles full of uh, highly explosive fuel whose temperature was rising. And even then it had some TNT on board for range safety breakup if it strayed outside the Woomera range limits. Also, I found out later that TNT uh, would use to simulate an air burst on the missile. Uh, they wanted to be, the option for the missile to air burst. Instead of putting a real nuke in it to do it, they used TNT to validate all the timing and sensing equipment that did the air burst. Also, because there was no tail parachute, all right, but they jettisoned the missile at the uh, Port Wakefield uh, artillery range. Several of the crew had confirmed switches for jettison and at the last minute the pilots could stop and then a go. Uh, he thinks he was the last to select his switch and away it went. It turns out that the stop calls were due to the pilots spotting a school below. Mm -hmm. Nice of them. There were two guards on the range where the jettison occurred and they had been told to keep a lookout for the bomb drop. No one thought to mention that it was 36 foot long weighed six plus tons and was full of explosive mixtures. So they walked out onto the sand to take a look. This was an army test range. This is where they tested artillery cells out over the water. Uh, apparently they heard the, the, the missile gurgling on the way down and took off to find their hard hats when it got rapidly larger. 
but it cr crashed relatively harmlessly and burnt out with only minor explosions between the high and low watermarks, but they certainly got a, sh a shock. It took them 90 minutes to burn enough fuel to, to land, uh, and we've already, already talked about that. Uh, despite the large excursions outside its design limits, the aircraft turned out to be in pretty good shape and after some minor repairs went on to launch many more Blue Steels for the trials, but this time at the Woomera range. Uh, later, XL161 returned to the UK and it was used for reconnaissance before being converted to a tanker. If you were to actually look on the Wikipedia website page, 161 is configured, there's a photograph of it there as a tanker. Now, needless to say, news of the incident leaked out. Oh dear. So about a week later, my dad loved telling this story. The crew and their uh, spouses, um, girlfriends, went out on the town uh, to ce celebrate their survival. If you know Edinburgh, it's well north of Adelaide, way to the north outskirts of Adelaide, Elizabeth up there. Well, they went to a little pub on the southwest of Adelaide a long way away and uh, to celebrate their survival. Whilst there, a reporter from the advertiser overheard the conversation, got talking to them, got a photograph and it was in the papers the next day, in the advertiser the next day. So uh, there goes your official secrets act, Dad. <laughs> so it was on the 23rd of August, uh, questions were asked in parliament. Initial response is we neither confirm or deny such things. And then the opposition started waving the paper. Well, they didn't have the paper. They started citing the paper reports. Uh, so late on the 23rd of August, the Minister of Supply uh, issued a press release. Um, that press release wasn't quite right. But then again, we, what is? <laughs> What's, what is different? So, uh, but that's what the, 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 the papers then the next day. So this is the Canberra Times on the 24th picking up that story and carrying it on in there. So I've used that photograph before, same photograph. Uh, and this one, this story, this newspaper clip is on Trove. Uh, and I've highlighted on there the, uh, the bit about fuel. The fuel exploded when the bomb uh, landed in seaweed down there uh, in St. Vincent's Coal. Because of the next uh, controversy, uh, that I wanted to talk about. We're nearly there. Uh, in, I went with my mum, took me to uh, the South Australian Aviation Museum in Port Adelaide in 2018 to show me something. Wouldn't tell me until we got there. Uh, this was a uh, display panel next to a, 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 a missile. It reads, the blue steel missile on display at the museum was recovered from Middle Beach, north of Adelaide after it was released, released from an aircraft transporting it. The aircraft developed serious flight difficulties and the pilot was forced to release the weapon to regain control of the aircraft. The weapon had no explosive capability. There was only one blue steel jettisoned in Australia. That's the one I've been talking about. Everything in that is wrong, except that it happened in South Australia. They weren't transporting it, they were testing it. Yes, they were carrying the weapon. They um, didn't, and this is what upset my mum because dad put the missile on there. They were, the family was very protective of the fact that it wasn't dad's fault <laughs> in there. But uh, it had to release the weapon to regain control of the aircraft. No, that's not right. That definitely is not right. Uh, and Middle Beach is actually 40 kilometers south of uh, the beach on which they dropped the thing. So um, the data that I get a lot of this stuff from, that's the, the website for John Saxon's article and his research. Um, but it, when you look at it, um, they brought 56 missiles to Australia. Uh, they launched either 48 or 49 because the data shows they launched number 62 twice. So that can't be right. <laughs> They're not reusable missiles. But about 50 missiles seems like a very British number, you know, bounded out to the tens. Uh, and so one was jettisoned, 49 uh, launched. But they did bring 56 missiles out there. So they, where are the other ones? I know there's one, that one there is in the uh, missile uh, park at Woomera. I know there's one in uh, Point Cook, in uh, the RAF Museum at Point Cook. 
Uh, the one in the South Australian Museum, that's what it looks like. Uh, when we walked out the back and had a look at it. Um, so that's definitely a blue steel. But this is what happened to the one that landed on the beach at Port Wakefield. That's the, uh, that's the hole in the ground uh, caused by, it was a, it was a ballistic drop. Uh, so it would have gone straight in as opposed to skidding along the beach or anything like that. So it's made a nice round crater and the debris is all around it. Now I made a point of uh, having a look at the motor before in one of those earlier slides of an installed motor. That's the, um, the, the larger of the two motors sitting in the wreckage at Port Wakefield. All right, so I don't know really what South Australian Air Museum's got, but it's not that missile. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's it. Um, you might want to have a read of that, um, but with that, I'll stop and take questions. Questions? Well, I'll make a comment. Uh, at Woomera, there's a missile standing up there, I think. Uh, in the, t in the edge of the town itself, there's uh, several aircraft on the ground there, including a Meteor. And, uh, I took a photograph of it in 1989 when I was on a little holiday from Australian Airlines. I was flying some people out to Woomera and to Maralinga in a Dove. I took a photograph. Might be interesting to show it to, to you later. But anyone else got a question or a comment? Not rather, uh, qu not a question. On that day, I was in Edinburgh. On the day of this incident. On the day of this. The aircraft from the meteor was A77705. So it wasn't it was Australian. an Australian Air Force one. Okay, okay. If I can very quickly tell you the story, I'd been uprange flying the helicopter for about three days and I had no contact with Australia. I came back on midday the 17th. CO met me at the aircraft told me the day before the red sails had crashed. I knew personally five of those people. The CO said, take the Mark 7, go to sail, come back when you're ready. One of my friends was at Edinburgh, so I flew to Edinburgh to pick him up. While I was in the flight planning, my aircraft had been refueled. The RAF confiscated the aircraft and that was the one that flew and checked the airspeed on the Victor. Okay. By the time they brought it back, it was too late for me to make the flight to East Sale because the funeral was the next day. Fortunately, the OC Edinburgh Air Commodore Gary uh, gave us a, a Dakota pilot, co-pilot and five of us flew to Sale for the funerals on the Friday and following Saturday. Okay. So I now know it is not an RAF aircraft. At the, All right. <laughs> the next two things, one of my jobs was when the blue steel was to be released, I would fly at the helicopter or a wind a 100 miles uprange and wait for the first. The first five I flew, I was 93 miles away from when it hit the ground because they all went ballistic. The motor did not start. Okay. Number seven, I'd actually landed the helicopter. There were two of us standing on a 60-foot tower, and the missile landed about a kilometre away. And we saw it land, we saw the explosion, and then we heard it come in. Okay. So that day, I was in Edinburgh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, yes, there's a clap. <laughs> A very good story. That, uh, that yes, story. I had assumed that it was a, a, a RAF meteor because it was had an RAF pilot, but they had they had uh, requisitioned it. Okay. There you go. Very 705. Good. Yes. Go ahead. I'm just wondering about the timings. You said that it took 20 seconds. So, how would they have known it was 20 seconds? And maybe that's where your calculation of being vertically supersonic was could, yeah. could be accounted for that might have taken they might have thought it took 20 seconds but it might have taken a lot longer than that all i can relate back is that um uh 
by the time John Saxon's reporting, and he's actually quite later, they had access to the flight instrumentation for the missile. So um, that would have been extensive uh, for the missile. And it, uh, that would be about the only thing that would, was recording that they could go back and reference. But yeah, I'm still skeptical about. Um, not, I didn't only have uh, um, uh, the pilot, um, John Baker's report, all the crew's reports are in my data. And one of them said, uh, the co-pilot said that the aircraft only fully rotated twice in the spin, slowly rotated twice. That doesn't sound like it's gone very vertically figure? fast, but okay. you know, I, I just have to relate some of, the, well, of what I've read. Mm. And yep, the flight instrumentation for the missile, uh, that's why it had the extra people on board. If it wasn't rotating rapidly, then, then how is it they got up to two or three G that made it impossible for them yeah. to, to because, get out of the aircraft? Because it may not have, excuse me, it may not have been a pure spin. It might have been pitching up and down, and that's yeah. where you'd get G-forces. They did say there were different phases to the whole thing, from the pitch up, wing over, flopping around the place, and then the spin, then the, the brake shoot. Uh, so there were a whole heap of things happened in quick succession. So, yeah. Daryl, many spot. thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, I'm sure you meant to say that the Victor was the most durable of the three V bombers, where it was still serving as a tanker in the Iraq war. But um, I meant to make um, two groups of comments. I'm intrigued by the fact that you and I were both children in Woomera, but I think I preceded you. My father was stationed there between 1953 and 55. He took part in the Canberra trials at the time. Uh, an old friend of his, um, who was an Air Force test pilot at the time, squadron leader, Ken Murray, also performed the trials in the Sabre uh, a little later on. I don't know whether that was at Woomera or Laverton. One of the escapades that I was involved in whilst we were at Woomera, along with a number of other partners in crime of about four, five and six years old, was we managed to find our way under the wire around the base, managed to um, head on down to the threshold of the main runway and we were found there lying on our backs, enjoying the view of aircraft as they landed. We were escorted off the runway <clears throat> and by the military police who were none too pleased with us. Um, another story from that time was the fact that a um, whole lot of Air Force officers had put in for a pay rise shortly before the 1954 election, and the government of the time knocked it back. So in the 54 election, all the Air Force personnel at Woomera voted communist, for the Communist <laughs> Party candidate. <laughs> and ASIO ended up going right through the place, interviewed every Everybody. member of the personnel there. Yeah. Oh, look, I, it, many of us... Uh... I, uh, uh, my other uh, comments relate to the fact that some uh, British aircraft later gave their names to certain British cars. So there was the Triumph Spitfire, for instance, the Handley Page Victor was supposed to have given its name to the Vauxhall Victor. And I mention that in particular because I've been restoring a Vauxhall Victor over the last 13 years. Um, we're now about oh, three to six months off being finished. Um, the car has been in my family since new. Um, it was a... <clears throat> it was... For a brief time, one of the best, uh, about the best selling British car um, of the period. And it was the first British car to be launched with a theatrical production. I've got that on DVD somewhere at home. But um, yes, I'm very much looking forward no, to be... driving it once it's finished. I might bring it out here sometime. A couple of things about what you said there. My first car that I owned was a Victor, oh. <laughs> Vauxhall Victor, <laughs> inherited. Was it I have no idea. Too long ago. Inherited from my grandfather, in fact. Uh, and my birth certificate, I was always proud to say my birth certificate at Woomera was number three. <laughs> but uh, I said that for years before I found out it was in book two. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, even two tone. Yeah, mine was looked like that, that's for, for sure. Right, another comment here. Um, just a comment about that voting. I was one of the officers at Woomera. <laughs> when the vote came out, I was very friendly with the three ASAO officers who knew exactly what had happened. You had a choice of Labor or Communist. Uh, and what Air Force officer would vote for Labour? Yeah. <laughs> End of question. End of question. <laughs> now, on that last slide I put up there, uh, that little comment about jibber jabber, um, I found that uh, in a trove search because of this magazine. This is a uh, in my dad's collection. It was an annual Christmas magazine put out at Woomera. This was the th third one, I think. Uh, third annual, anyway, and it's called Jibber Jabber. Uh, Jibber Jabber. It's in terrible condition, and my parents aren't mentioned in here, but um, there is an article in here um, that uh, had a bookmark in it. And I, does anybody read German? No. I don't. <laughs> I'm going to have a go at this because you will have seen this, I'm sure. This is from 1958 uh, in uh, the English-German vocabulary. Guided missile is called Das Speerfeuer, Das Speerfeuerke Geschlafenwerks Firecracken. Oh. Yeah, there's somebody's having one of those goes in there. The bookmark in there is an article that talked about uh, the, the satellite uh, tracking station where my mum listened to Sputnik. So, um, yeah. Questions online? Yes. yes. Anybody out in the Zoom land there with some questions? Uh, That's good. Hi. Look, it's, it's Melbourne here. Um, yes. My only comment is I, I think there must be a mistake with the either the altitude or the time because as as you said it's it's a supersonic speed down to 16,000 feet which is 17 miles in a third of a minute and and it works out to 3,000 miles an hour unless yeah. my maths are very wrong have you got any comment on have you thought about that I, I tried to, to validate it, but um, all I've got uh, in addition to that is the records of the other crew um, and uh, their timing was consistent. Um, but you know, whether it was 20 seconds or the, the whole altitude over 60 seconds is probably a better way to look at it. But the um, don't forget after they deployed the chute and it corrected the nose uh, attitude, the chute didn't last very long uh, and they were heading straight down and had to pull out. Um, so down there, they might have been for an instant uh, supersonic. But yeah, I'm with you. I can't believe it. I, I can just all I can do is report what others have said. Hello, Daryl. That was a very interesting presentation. I uh, was. Uh intrigued by your photo of the, the Black Knight rocket, where you said it's perhaps uh, the, the perspective is making it look bigger than it really is. And I took the chance to, to drag out Google while I was listening. And uh, it is 11 metres high. And, and as you said, very similar to the length of the Blue Steel. And there's actually one uh, on display at the Wormer uh, Rocket uh, uh, Park. Um, might be. Uh, and so that's interesting that one survives. And I saw a blue steel at the RAF Museum back in, I think, the 19, um, late 1970s, early 1980s. And I did see that there is a blue steel on display again at the Woomera Rocket Park. So I don't know whether the RAF Museum still has one or whether the one at Woomera is the one that I saw at Point Cook for a period. Yeah, uh, I, but I have two survivors in the country. Yeah, that's consistent with what I've seen. I saw the one at Point Cook in in the in 1978, 
and, uh, and the Woomera one is there now. I know because the restoration group um, out at Ambly uh, is doing a restoration project at Woomera uh, that started during COVID and is not quite finished yet. But they've been occasionally bringing missiles back from Woomera to Ambly to restore them for the missile park or traveling to Woomera and restoring them out there. I'll look through my old photographs from 1989 and see have a good look at the photograph I took from the air of the rocket park there. And you can see it yeah. uh, in Google Earth and uh, Street View now. Um, I don't know how current that one is. I've, I've got a photograph of the, the one at Point Cook, probably in the 70s, I yeah. believe it had a red tip nose from memory. Well, painted white, but with a red tip nose. Yeah. I can oh. dig, I'll dig it out for you. Okay. Thanks, Bob. No, I'm, I picked my date because I was there at OTS uh, when I saw it uh, in, so that was 78 or something for me. Okay, you looked at the crickets on, guys. Has anybody <laughs> online got the score? <laughs> well, thank you very much for that lovely story. That's all right. And it's ins and outs and comments all around. And uh, thanks very much, Daryl. Thank you.